Okay, update video. I filmed an entire uh, video without pushing the, the on button on my microphone. Okay. So, I'm going to start over. 30-minute video was wasted. Anyway, here's Kevin. There you go. He was in the last video. Uh, I'm going to be moving up to Vermont to live with my dad. Because he's having a hard time uh, moving around. So uh, I, you won't be seeing Kevin much in the next year or so. So I just want to show him on video. Right, buddy? And uh, eventually when I have a house or a cottage or something up there in New Hampshire probably, uh, I'll take it with me. Okay, but for now he's going to stay here at the house with, uh, with everybody else. Okay, so now hopefully the microphone is working. I'll give you the update. All right. Um, I've got a lot of New Year's resolution stuff written down, a lot of errands and tasks and stuff. One of the main things is to try to cater to uh, new people. Most of the people that watch the channel are in two categories. Never been to the channel before and are new to napping. The vast majority of people that watch the channel are in those two categories. Now I've got a lot of regular guys and gals that watch the channel. You guys are awesome. Always, you're always watching the channel. Whenever you get a notification, you know how to set up notifications is that kind of thing. And uh, you're always in the comment section and stuff. But for the most part, most of the gener most of the views that I get are from completely new people. All right. So I'm going to try to cater to those viewers. That's the one New Year's resolution. The next one is I'm going to uh, be doing more in-depth analysis of napping, especially with the uh, pressure flaking stuff. I've done a lot of percussion. The pressure flaking is what I have not done much of, uh, in my view. So I'll be doing more of that. Uh, more into the actual bow making and arrow making also. Uh, the problem I've had here in Texas, and especially where I live in, in West Texas, is that there are times where the weather changes drastically from humid to dry. It can be 70% humidity one day and then all the way down to 20% humidity the next. And then a long stretch of very low humidity will ruin my bows uh, to an extent. Uh, there's something called case hardening on wood where the outside gets harder than the inside. And when you're exercising the bow or shooting the bow, you can hear cracking and once in a while, it will raise a splinter on the bow, which is very, very aggravating. Okay. Uh, where I'm going in Vermont, the temperature, I'm not temperature, the humidity variation isn't as great. So I'll, I have more of a enthusiasm or more of a incentive to build bows there. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, that goes for arrows too. The the the, the uh, drastic humidity changes from humid to dry to humid to dry messes with the wood a lot here where I am, and it was very very frustrating for me in the beginning because when I first started this primitive stuff, I was making archery uh, bows and arrows as a hobby, and uh, the arrowhead was just something I never really thought too much about because I could just take a piece of steel and um, put it on the grinder and shape it or take a piece of bone and put it on the sander and shape it. I wasn't really into making stone points until I started looking at artifacts and becoming interested in Native American artifacts. And I said, I want to learn how to do that. So I set about learning how to do that and lo and behold, everyone else that I was watching me wanted to learn how to do it also. It wasn't just 
a spectator sport. They wanted to learn how to do it. So I started answering questions and then I started posting videos. So the majority of my time now is spent on flint napping as far as the videos and my hobby is concerned. And it's, it's all from an outgrowth of answering questions. Okay. From that basic concept, I've also tried to get into debunking certain ideas or coming up with, trying to come up with alternate possibilities for how these things were made in the past. Now, sometimes I get myself into trouble or I step on toes or I offend people or I get them uh, angry. <laughs> when I say uh, stuff like, that's just a thought experiment or uh, you don't really know what you're talking about, not fully, or you're just making stuff up or that's just, um, you're just regurgitating what you've heard before without experimenting, without seeing exactly what you're talking about, okay? When I got into flint napping, one of the things I, I really liked about it, other than producing arrowheads and using them, uh, using knives and stuff for cutting and arrowheads for shooting uh, animals, one of the things I, I liked about it was it's, it grounds you in skill development. Skill development can ground you into the truth, plug you into how something actually is okay now but there is a difference between being skilled and being knowledgeable in in general you can be very specifically skilled but that doesn't translate into general knowledge now in on some channels that's what they're trying to uh, show you they're trying to do it. They're trying to show you that very focused skills translate into general knowledge, and it's not true. Okay? Um, that's one thing that I'm seeing. Just because someone is skilled doesn't mean they know what they're talking about, in other words. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing to watch out for if you're new. If you're new, you want to try to absorb everything from all videos, but just be aware that some videos are showing you things that are true if you just watch what you're, if you just under, try to understand what you're seeing with your eyes and uh, not necessarily uh, absorbing what you're hearing. Just watch what you're seeing. Now, there are some people, and I make fun of people sometimes, right? <laughs> uh, or I'll, I'll make a comment that this person, I'll say, stop listening with your eyes and stop uh, hear, uh, stop, um, stop listening with your eyes and stop um, seeing with your ears. Okay? And they say, what is that? What that means is some people will only accept what they're looking at if they like what they hear. And some people will only accept what is being told to them if they like what they see. Don't be that guy. Okay? If you are that kind of guy, you will be duped by some of these other, um, how should I say, some of these other channels that uh, go into uh, falsehoods and try to support um, ideas that are not, not true. Okay. Now, this is just for the new guys. Guys that have been watching videos for a long time or they know how to flint nap. They don't fall for this kind of stuff. But just be aware, if you're new, which most of you are, that not you can't learn uh, from every channel. Although you're trying to absorb from lots of channels. And I'm not saying that you can 
learn from my channel because my channel is so great. No, I'm saying that just be careful of what you are trying to learn from. A lot of people have trouble flint napping and it's hard enough without having to uh, try to figure out which flint napping channel is telling you the truth or not. It's hard. Uh, w one way to know, and it takes time to know this, one way to know that uh, someone is not really on the up and up is if they're napping to a narrative instead of just showing you different kinds of napping. All right. If they're napping to a narrative, what they're doing is using their skill to support an idea. The idea comes down, let's say, that overshots are good as an example. Okay. So to nap to that narrative, you start making lots of overshots and you're saying, you say to the audience, see how good that is? That's napping to the narrative. Uh, just for your information, overshots are a mistake related to thinning. Okay. I've proven that over and over and over and over again on this channel. Overshots are a mistake due to the technology surrounding thinning. Right? Thinning is the technology, not the overshot. There are various types of mistakes in thinning. Step fracturing is one. Overshots are another. Uh, reverse hinges are another. Uh, radio cracks are another. These are mistakes in thinning. They're not intentional. They're incidental. Okay? I've, I've shown that, and hopefully I've proven that over and over. Okay? If you're new, just be aware of that's just one example. There are other examples out there. Okay? One other example is if you are being told that there's no way to learn how to make identical flakes with different tools. Each tool makes a certain flake, which means, which implies that flakes have certain signatures that are attached to certain tools. That's totally false. It can be true in some cases, maybe. I haven't seen it yet. I'm, I'm, just, I'm open to the possibility that a certain type of material will always create a certain type of flake that cannot be confused or duplicated by any other method. I haven't personally seen it, but I, I think it might be possible. But in the vast majority of cases, different tools can be used to create the exact same flake. Okay? And techniques as well. Different techniques with different tools can be used to make the exact same flake. For instance, flute flakes or thinning flakes from the base, or, or channel flakes, or whatever you want to call them, that can be done with different methods and look identical with different methods and different tools, different materials on your tools. What do we mean by different materials on the tools? Well, if you're using natural tools, you've got hammer stone, you've got antler, you've got bone, you've got horn, uh, and all the different varieties of each. You got different varieties of hammer stones, different varieties of antler, different varieties of bone, and different varieties of horn, as an example. Okay? But you also have different flint nappers. You've got highly skilled flint nappers that are using hammer stones, as an example, that can create the same flakes as slightly skilled nappers using antler billets. And they're producing the same exact type of flake. Okay. There's technicalities that I don't want to go into to know why and how that was done. And show you that it can be done. Uh, but I, I won't get into that aspect. Just be aware that to answer the question, how was it done in the past is very complicated and nobody really knows. We have an idea. And the more we explore that, the closer we get to these different possibilities, okay? But we may all be in the wrong uh, area in many cases. Like, for instance, we may be using too many hard hammer stones in our natural napping. We might be using too many soft hammer stones. Uh, comparatively speaking to what they've used in the past, let's say, in North America. We may be antler heavy 
in our napping. We may be not exploring the possibility of using small pieces of copper in our napping, in our natural tool napping. I'm still talking about natural tools and that sort of thing. Copper is perishable. If it's just a small piece of copper that they were using for sharpening, let's say, at the very last stage, uh, that copper is going to, a lot of times, be eaten away by the conditions of the soil and you won't see it. But they, in some cases, we do see little awls. They call them awls. And uh, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, um, there is such a thing as a copper culture in North America copper culture before European contact Native Americans were using copper for various things for thousands of years okay it's called the copper culture now South America it's even more extensive but in North America copper was extremely abundant in the Great Lakes area and it spread out from there okay so in the Great Lakes area you see bigger artifacts made from copper and as you get further away, you see smaller and smaller artifacts, and sometimes none made of copper. Uh, the smaller they get, the more, easy, the more easily they are deteriorated and become nothing. But it doesn't mean they didn't exist. As an example, okay, as an example trying to explain how they were made. Now, you might say, well, how can I be discussing how they were being made with natural tools if I personally use lots of metals and weird techniques? <laughs> Yeah, I use lots of metals and weird techniques. Okay, how can I be discussing that? Well, I do have a channel called Allergic Hobbit that I do only natural materials. And I started with only natural materials and no copper. Just antler, hammer, stone, and bone, and horn, and whatever else I can get my hands on, wood to nap with. I do have that channel there. Uh, but... To answer questions on how it was done, first I need to, I, I realized that I needed to explore the various ways that one can flint nap in order to try to answer that question and not try to narrow it down to just a few tools and techniques. And I realized that I, I was being, I had pressure on me to conform to a certain culture of napping. I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but uh, if you're napping to a narrative, it's easier to justify that procedure if there's already a culture in place that will accept that type of napping and that type of narrative. All right. I noticed that in the beginning, and there are people that will bug you about the way you're napping. That's not the way to go about learning how it was done in the past. You can't narrow your focus. You have to expand your you have to expand your experience so that we can capture hopefully how it was done within one of the methods that we're exploring. It has to be within one of the methods that we're exploring. We can't narrow ourselves down at all. Okay. So that's why I go into other materials and other techniques just so I can explore the different types of napping. That's one reason. Another reason why I go into different materials is because some people only have modern tools. They don't have access, or if they do, it's very expensive to get antler and hammer stones, believe it or not. Uh, I know I've spent hundreds of dollars in the beginning on antlers just to get moose antler and stuff. I go through natural materials very quickly so i was having to purchase lots of antler because i was cracking the antler or breaking it uh, abusing it because i do a lot of percussion it was it was highly expensive and i said well this is fine but i need to go into other aspects anyway so let me just explore other materials and sure enough it's much cheaper just to grab a piece of steel or a piece of aluminum and start napping with that. And it's just as good. All right. It's just as good at learning how to nap and learning the different techniques. Now you have to make an adjustment in your brain according to every material. That's, that's true. But there's at least, there's a, 
this is a rule, in my opinion, this is a rule in flint napping. There's at least two different ways to make the same exact flake. At least. There are many different techniques and tools that can produce the same types of flakes that you see in artifacts. So we don't know exactly how they were made. We have an idea, but we don't know. Some people don't like that idea that what I'm saying is there are many different ways to make the same flake. Some people insist that there are only certain ways to make certain flakes, and that implies flake signatures, which means it's unique. Somehow that flake is unique to a certain tool or certain method. I'm saying that's false. And I'm trying to prove that on my channel. That's one of the main things that I try to debunk is that there's distinctive flakes attached to certain tools and techniques. Now, that is true in some cases, but not all cases. And in fact, in the majority of cases, that is not true. Now, some people will ask me, how is this, how do you think this was made? And I'll, I'll tell them, well, it's probably made with an antler tine or something like that and a hammer stone. Well, how do, why would I say something like that when I'm spouting that there's no such things as certain flakes made by certain tools? I'm saying that in general. Okay. But if I wanted to get down to exactly how it was made, and if someone says, okay, is that exactly how it was made? I would say, I don't know. I could be totally wrong. That napper might not have had hammerstone or an antler tie. It may have been a composite tool. A, a rock attached to a stick as a hammer. And a antler or a piece of bone inserted into a piece of wood as a pressure flaker. Those are composite tools. They're not individual, just a stone by itself or an antler tying by itself. There's a difference both in the technique and the effect, all right, in how they work. But they can be they can produce the same flakes. Like the composite tools can produce the same flakes as the, I don't know, the singular tools. There's an overlap there in how these flakes are made. You can make the same exact flake with different tools, and there's different techniques in employing those tools. Okay? That's what I mean by we don't know exactly how it was done. There are many different ways, and I'm trying to explore the various ways that these things can be done, and I'm not going to narrow it down and bug people that they're not following a certain culture or a certain trend or a certain idea or a th certain thought experiment. Okay? So if you're new, this is mainly for you. That this little rant was mainly for you because the guys that have been watching the channel for a while. They, you, you already know this. You already know this. Okay, so where was I? I think I mentioned that I have New Year's resolutions and stuff. Uh, I'm going to continue in the same vein on this channel, but try to explore a little bit more into bow making and other things like knife making and stuff. I'm also going to try to... Um, improve the quality of the narration. I've been studying ADHD and how people learn and all these related subjects and topics. And uh, hopefully I can improve the channel, well, both with my presentation and in what you guys want to see. Uh, I haven't touched my other two channels, Allergic Hobbit and PAB Philosophy for a while because I'm trying to focus on this channel. Uh, I mean, I'd like to bounce around between them all, but it, um, it takes time to get adjusted to each type. Like I have a channel devoted specifically to natural tools used in flint napping. That's called Allergic Hobbit. And then I have a, tool, I have a channel uh, that used to be named after me, Patrick Blank. That was just my musings in these experimental archaeology. And then I got into philosophy. It's now called PAB Philosophy. What I'm going to do, now that I'm thinking about it, what I'm going to do on the philosophy channel is probably delete or take down or make unlisted most of the videos so I can focus mainly on philosophy and condense the philosophy into two or three two or three main videos <clears throat> that explain and encapsulate my philosophy quickly. And then from there I can branch out 
into tangents. So I'll be working on that. I'll be living with my dad in Vermont, if I haven't mentioned that already. Uh, the reason why I'm confused about what I've mentioned or not is because I filmed a whole 30 minute video prior to this and I didn't get the, I didn't turn the microphone on. So I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but I'll be living with my dad in Vermont. I'll be traveling up there. I've been packing. I've been rearranging my shop and getting everything ready to move to Vermont where my dad's house is. I eventually want to live in New Hampshire right across the border. But right now I'm going to be in Vermont. Uh, in the next week or two weeks i'll be you'll see i'll be filming from there you'll see a difference anyway um i mentioned that because i'm going to be trying to expand on my philosophy channel uh i don't always think about flint napping believe it or not okay i don't always think about making bows and arrows uh and my my trade is drafting, okay? I love architecture and drafting and making drawings. Uh, I was drafting for more than 17 years. My, uh, my, most of my uh, professional experience is in making blueprints and also uh, ensuring that sh the shop was conforming to the standards of the blueprints and the client demands and all that kind of stuff. My last job was in an engineering spot in an oil company that produced machinery. Okay. Uh, I left that job to become a stay at home dad. So I stayed at home with the kids for about uh, 10 years. Okay. Otherwise, I would have still been drafting, and it would have been like 27 years total, or 24 years. Maybe I, okay. I'm not sure exactly how many years, because it was on and off for, with drafting. But anyway, probably at least 14 years, solid drafting behind a computer with computer-aided drafting. I also know how to do the hand-drawing type stuff. Anyway, that's my, that's my trade. So I don't always do flint napping, even though now I have a small business uh, doing flint napping, which is very enjoyable. Mostly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do other things. So I want to do the philosophy stuff and get that uh, encapsulated and uh, solidified and get all my ideas out in that respect. So I don't start rambling during my flint napping videos about philosophy. I'll ramble about other stuff and mainly experimental archaeology stuff. Okay, that's what I want to do on this channel. Experimental archaeology answering questions, especially for new people, revamping my uh, beginner series for different things, uh, going into more materials as far as modern materials, uh, doing some more uh, natural tool techniques on my other channel and, you know, get that up and running again. That sort of thing this coming year. Hopefully I'll be able to do that. <clears throat> now, Another thing, for those of you who have sent me stuff, I just want to get this out. I've put a lot of it on the side, and I want to apologize ahead of time. A lot of that stuff I'm not going to be able to get to. I have stuff in boxes that I need to get to in Vermont. I've got stuff in boxes I need to get to here. One of the reasons why I put stuff to the side is because either the stuff is extremely difficult to nap, and I need to spend a lot of time learning how to nap it, or I really don't like that material, or it's not what I expected when someone sent it to me. So I just kind of put it to the side and uh, lost interest. So if you want to send me something, uh, please make sure you tell me ahead of time or, or snap some pictures or give me as much information as possible ahead of time. And don't send me too many things, okay? Uh, like a box of maybe one or two items is okay, but... Uh, I've had people send me a, a big box with like 20 different types of flint. And can you can you demonstrate how to nap all these? And I say, well, okay, I'll, I'll try because I hate to say no, right? And I, I never get to it. I get to maybe, maybe one or two pieces and that's it. So, yeah, I want to apologize ahead of time for those people who have sent me stuff. I got a lot of stuff, actually. As I've been trying to clear out my my junk, I've noticed all these boxes and stuff. I got a big stack.
anyway, I'll try to get to some of those. Uh, some of the stuff I'll never be able to get to because I either mixed it in with my, my other stash and I, I can't remember what's what, or I've lost it or I've given it away. I will give away some of the stuff that I've received uh, because I know I'm never going to nap it. Now, I hope that's, that's okay. Uh, especially at nappings, I'll bring stuff that other people have given to me. And someone will give me something at the nap in also, and I end up giving either all of it or some of that stuff away sometimes. Uh, like, I've, I've napped a Flint River, no, what is it? Knife River Flint before, as an example. But there are some guys that have never napped it, never seen it, don't know what it is, and it's supposedly really, really good stuff. So I give it away at a nap in that someone had given to me. Now, I recently had someone ask me to do the uh, Knife River Flint napping on video. I got to look to see where his box is. If I can find it, I'll nap it. But uh, otherwise, I won't be able to get to it. Uh, and that sort of thing. Okay, so I, I, I want, just want to make you aware, if you do send me something, please uh, give me as much information as possible up front. And don't send me too much. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. This is hard to try to remember what I have not covered. Anyway, it's already 31 minutes. I can cut it off here. Um, the material I have and the material I'm bringing to Vermont is only about this big. This big. Okay, I got a lot of this stuff. It's, what is it, four inches? That's it. Now, I don't mind receiving requests to do stuff on the side in certain cases. I don't mind it. In most cases, I do because they want stuff that's longer than four inches. But I'm not taking big stuff up to Vermont. Okay, so I can do a request on the side for points longer than four inches and usually I try to stay within three inches as a general rule for stuff on the side I've had nightmares where I've been requested to do stuff seven eight nine inches long and tried to procure that material by buying it and end up spending in one case over a thousand dollars just so I can sell one piece for $65. Okay, it doesn't work. Not, not in any sense of the word. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a good experience, and now I can relay it to you. But in terms of trying to fill an order like that, it it's uh unless I have a different stream of income, it, it's a big waste of my time and effort. So I'm not gonna do it. All right, um, and money, time, effort, and money is is wasted um, on that particular project. Luckily, with flint napping, I can use waste and debitage for other projects. So, I did recoup most of that investment in that particular case. There are other cases where I try to get certain materials, and uh, it didn't work out. Uh, now, I will share with you sources that have been good that I have had experience with. Okay. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I have a list of my sources. I'll share those with you if you want to know where to buy a rock. Uh, I, I have a nap-in list. I try to post a nap-in list every video that I make. And I will update it. That's another thing that's in my resolutions for the year. Try to update my map in list with current 2024 dates. It's not a mistake that the most of those dates are 2023 because I just haven't updated it for 2024. And many of those don't have the new dates yet because they, they haven't posted their new dates. But I'll try to update. There's one coming up in February in this month at Silver River Napping in 
Ocala, Florida. There's a new, I think it's 17th and 18th of this month. As an example, I need to put that in the napping list. Um, and that kind of thing. I need to update that list. All right. What else? Yeah, if you have any questions, just put them in the comment section, as always. I will still have auctions every Monday. That's not going to change. Um, I'll still have silent videos, no talk videos. I'll have flint yapping videos where I just goof around, nap, uh, yapping, whatever topic comes to mind uh, pertaining to experimental archaeology and that sort of thing, and maybe some other stuff. And I want to do the on this channel, I want to do more hafting and bow and arrow shooting. I have shot some at lateral darts before, but I need longer uh, range capacity. Right now, I'm confined to very small areas. I think I do have a friend in New York that I'll be able to, to shoot long distance on his property, right, when I go up to Vermont. So hopefully, I'll be able to shoot long distance, which is uh, something I want to do. Uh, just to experiment with the effectiveness of the atletal darts and the arrows at different ranges. Okay, uh, I I am getting more into hunting. I did I did hunting this year here in Texas, which was nice. Uh, I might be able to do some hunting up there in Vermont. Uh, they do have a, a very good deer population up there. Um, of course, unfortunately, also Lyme disease, so i got to be careful about that. So I might not do that much hunting. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah. Now, I do like hunting, but I don't like showing the hunting on video. Okay, I like showing the results. I'll process the animals on, the, on video. Like I did a video or a series of videos on removing tendons from elk legs for use in sinew for various uh, applications of sinew. Tendons are sinew, in case you didn't know. <clears throat> uh, did I show this already? I got a bunch of elk backstrap that I had processed this week. This is batch number three. I got two more batches like this. So I got plenty of elk backstrap. Oh, and uh, my my backstraps always come out this red color. Um, I've seen backstraps come out nice and yellow, or almost bleached white. I don't know how you guys do it. I guess I leave the 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 uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, tendon on the meat too long and the blood soaks in or something. But anyway, um, I've got leg tendon as well as the back strap i got three batches of that too so i got plenty of that i got plenty of bow wood that has not been worked down and hopefully it's still in good shape i'm going to, i'm going to take some of that up to vermont but there's a lot of stuff in vermont that i can use especially black locust which is a nice wood i like it um What else? I think that's it. It's going to be cold when I get up there, so hopefully it won't um, interfere with my, with my productivity. I, I napped last, last time I was there, I did nap through the winter, but I had to nap out of the back of my van in order to get, uh, stay warm enough outside. Um, and yeah, I did have the the back hatch open a little bit for ventilation, so don't worry about that part. I understand the ventilation and the uh, the risks of silicosis with flint napping. I only nap two days a week. Seriously nap two days a week. If I do nap other days, it's just little little nappings. It's not a heavy-duty spalling session or anything. The spalling is very dust-intensive. The spalling and making bifaces. So I limit that to... One day or two days a week. Let's see what else. Mm -hmm, 
I got new, uh, I got new tripods and uh, stuff like that. New lighting. I'm in the process of buying new stuff for my shop too. New tools. Modern stuff. These are, you can buy these handles for these needle files, but I find that they're useful for pressure flaking. This is a 10 penny shiny uh, finish nail, 10 D or 10 penny. It fits in this needle file handle and it can be used as a pressure flaker. And it can have, you can have a spatula tool on there too. You know, it's a kind of screwdriver sort of like, I call it a spatula tool for notching, stuff like that. I've been exploring that kind of thing. Um, what else? Yeah, I'll try to work on my other channels. Get that, get the natural tool channel up and running. That's got more subscribers than my philosophy channel. Uh, but they're both, when I post on them, they both start to, to become active. Obviously. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, one of the main reasons why I want to still continue with the channel is because of the question and answer type of thing. I enjoy answering questions and exploring how things were made, and I like the scientific method, and I like trying to be more rational and learning how to be more rational and how to spot BS. Okay, and I'll make fun of it if I see some BS. I, I'm not going to go on someone else's channel and and uh, try to strike up an argument, but I, I will talk smack <laughs> on this channel, as you know, if you've been watching. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I talk smack about overshots. You know what overshots are, right? When you take off some of the other side when you're trying to reduce down, let's say, a biface. You shoot a flake across and it takes part of the other side off. If I haven't mentioned this already, there, that's a, that's, the overshot is a, uh, a mistake in thinning. Thinning has several types of mistakes associated with it. Step fracturing, hinge fracturing. Almost the same thing. <clears throat> radial fractures, or end snap, sometimes they call it. But it's, radial fractures usually at the point of impact and not somewhere else, right? So that radial fractures are part of mistake in thinning. Uh, undetached flakes, you know, you hit and the flake doesn't pop out and cause a step fracture. It just doesn't never pops out. It just stays within the material and you can't get it out. That's a mistake in thinning. And the overshot is a mistake in thinning. Now, some people will get angry at that statement because they think overshots are good. And they're napping to a narrative that says overshots are good. Overshots are not good. Anything can be useful in certain situations. Okay. Can a step fracture be useful in a certain situation? Well, yeah, because... As long as you go past halfway and you get a step fracture, uh, at least you got past halfway. Maybe you knew you were going to get a step fracture at the end, but you can always get it from the other side if it's, you know, past halfway or within reach of another flake from the other side. You can disregard the possibility of a step fracture at the end, and it can be useful because the, the most of the flake will get you where you want to go. Same with overshots. Most of that flake can get you where you want to go, but it takes off too much of the other side. Okay, it might be useful in some cases, but it's a mistake, just like a step fracture. Uh, a radial crack, when you, which is, let's say this is the workpiece, a radial crack is this way, through the material, and it cuts it in two pieces. Those two pieces can be useful as scrapers. So it can be useful in some cases, but most of the cases, it's a mistake. If you have a snap, 
an end snap also where the edge is 90 degrees to the surface of the piece, you can use it as a scraper. It works really well. But it doesn't mean that it was intentional. Okay? You can create those kind of flakes or those kind of breakages intentionally, but there's no reason to do it when you're thinning, which is the vast majority of cases with these mistakes is there are mistakes in thinning, and that includes overshot. And I think, and I've been trying to prove it, and I'll talk smack about anyone who says it's not a mistake. Okay? Um, that sort of thing. There are narratives out there that I want to debunk, more than the ones I've already mentioned. Um, I, I read, believe it or not, I read arch archaeological texts. Uh, I try to stay away from them nowadays because they get repetitive. They regurgitate outdated material. The state of science in general these days is very poor. Uh, they, uh, it's a very authoritarian these days where they say, a, they say something and they try to support that something. They'll, they'll invent a narrative and they'll try to support the narrative. In many cases, they think that testing a hypothesis is testing to see if they can find something to support that hypothesis. That's not testing a hypothesis. Testing a hypothesis is trying to find holes in it where it's false, either in all cases or in some cases. All right, let's say I, I want to try to prove something. The best way to do it is to take the opposite view and debunk the opposite view. Like, let's say I, I want to um, uh, prove that there are such things as free will, which does affect flint napping, believe it or not. That question, it's not just a moral question. It's a skill question as well. Uh, let's say I wanted to promote the idea that free will is a thing. Well, the best way for me to do that is to, su to assume that there is no such thing as free will. I'll assume that there is no such thing and then try to bring positive evidence to debunk that. Okay? Now, I've assumed in the past that everything is determined, but I've found holes in that theory. Okay, the most obvious hole recently has been with quantum physics. We know that the universe is not determined because quantum physics tells us that determinism with respect to these very small things is not a thing. Determinism is not a thing within the uh, quantum physics arena. Now, determinism or things that are deterministic do exist. <clears throat> Okay, but uh, the, the, re the way that I want to pursue a scientific inquiry or a scientific uh, pursuit is to assume the opposite and then debunk it. Okay, like it, with, uh, with uh, overshots, let's assume that there was good. Is there any way that it would not be good? Yeah, there's a hole in that, right? Right away, it takes off too much of the other side. So how is that good? In some cases, it doesn't take much off the other side. So can that be good? Yeah, maybe. But in the majority of the cases, it's easily debunked. If you assume that overshots are good, as an example, it's easy to debunk that because I can get an overshot that's really bad. <laughs> okay, it's, it seems like Captain Obvious uh, came up with this rule, but that's the way you're supposed to pursue science in my view and in the view of many philosophers Not that I'm saying that a consensus is something that we need to pay attention to but it's not just my idea That's what I'm uh, getting at Okay, yeah, science consensus is not science Which is what they try to do these days as well. It's a pseudo Pseudoscience involves various things. 
consensus, trying to support an argument rather than debunking it, uh, becoming authoritarian in your approach, uh, and that sort of thing. At least three different things are being done in science these days that is totally uh, ruining the, the conversation. And uh, we're, we, we're ending up with pseudoscience in majority of cases, and that bleeds over into the, unfortunately, archaeological texts and the uh, interpretation of the data. Okay. All right. I won't get into that. It's already 50 minutes longer than the last video, and hopefully my microphone is still working. Green button. Yeah. All right. So that's it. I'll be trying to do a lot more videos today. Seven something. Almost seven. 638. All right. So, yeah, I'll try to do more videos today and tomorrow. And then I'll be running a bunch of errands and then, you know, on the road and stuff next week. So, yeah. All righty. We'll see you on the next video.